now, let's welcome Emily Bryson. Rock and roll. Welcome, Hello. Emily. Thank you so much for being in the live. It's a great honor to have you with us today. And we are your student. You are the teacher. And we can't wait to see you on the board. <laughs> Thanks so much for having me. It's lovely to be here. And what a cool intro. <laughs> I feel like yeah. I'm really on Rock and roll. Program. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's, you know, rock and roll, you got to be a little bit more entertaining sometimes. We can yeah. definitely speak about everything and, you know, have a good fun, right? Teachers are just people like everyone, like, uh, you know. So, yeah, can you please introduce yourself uh, to everyone so that we know you a little bit uh, better? Uh, I didn't make mistakes when I was saying uh, that all nope. your expertise, that it's incredible for uh, a teacher. I'm very honored to have you here. Yep, so I've got, thank you very much. Uh, uh, yeah, you were bang on. You were completely correct. Mm -hmm. okay. I have about, okay. I started teaching in 2001 at a summer school in Poland. And then when I finished university, I went to South Korea and taught there for a year. And then I went back to Scotland and I've been teaching uh, people seeking refuge and asylum for about, uh, oh well, since about 2006. Um, and then last okay. year, and while I was doing that, I've been writing lots of materials. I wrote the Voices, um, I co-authored the Voices series for National Geographic Learning. I've also done the Teaching Through Crisis series for National Geographic Learning, which is a series of teacher development videos for um, anybody teaching in times of crisis, for example, in a war zone or teaching people from refugee backgrounds or who have experienced trauma, oh. that kind of thing. Yeah, and I, yeah, I've recently published a book with the Hands Up Project. Actually, that's just last week, and these are all activities with drawing around your hands, and it's titled Hands Up for Peace, and it, all proceeds go to the children that um, the Hands Up Project teaches in Palestine. So, really, really worthwhile cause, and really that's fantastic awesome. so set of classroom activities that are minimal preparation. <laughs> Congratulations! So, it, it's called Hands Up. Uh, project, right? Yeah, yeah. And the title's Hands Up for Peace. So the project's Hands Up Project, and they do a lot of remote theatre um, with uh, kids in Gaza. And actually, while I was writing it, obviously the war kicked off and yeah. the situation worsened, and the Hands Up Project have been sharing videos of people people's real lives in Palestine and some of them are really quite harrowing so while I was writing it I was thinking mm, is there any point in writing this but I felt also like not writing it was giving up hope and I think the hands up project gives hope to the kids in Palestine because they're still getting those lessons So this is a story that somebody told me when I was a kid. There was a man, and he got chased by bees. So he ran up a hill, and then he kept running around the hill because they were still chasing him. And he ran around and ran around, and finally he came to some caves. And he went inside the caves, and the bees didn't chase him anymore. What is it? And so that's basically drawing using the alphabet. And the dog, I don't know if you noticed, it was like a kind of Nike swoosh tick, and then a number two, yeah. and then a letter yeah. L, and then a triangle. So with drawing, drawing, some people believe they can't draw, but in reality, everybody can draw. Um, they just need to, maybe some just need some practice. And mm -hmm. Uh, the drawing alphabet is basically a series of triangles, lines, squares, and maybe letters as well.
integrate these doodles and just practice doing them and stuff and get them into as lots and lots of lessons because yeah. it's it's clear that there's so much you can do with it and i, I made like a a video last week I've, I've literally just uploaded it now and it was just about how the board is so important because yeah. it's central it's big it's uh, everyone can refer to it it's right dead in the middle and it's such a useful tool that probably isn't used as much as it could be right yeah like we write down task instructions on it or you know maybe explain some grammar or something like that and then we move away from it and then we start moving around the class but actually you can do much more yeah. from the board yeah and i checked out i did have a quick look at sketch note it's really cheap as well like it's like it's not expensive at all you know and yeah. it's like and if if you're teaching all of the time it will make your life so much easier make cut down on planning time your students understand better you get better results uh you get better outcomes from your learners it's just a it's a no-brainer yeah and I've, I've actually, I had the luxury in my classroom of having two whiteboards. Well, one was like an entire wall and the other was like the side whiteboard that none of the other teachers used. And that side whiteboard, it was in the class where everybody was teaching literacy. So that shared whiteboard became like a giant sketch note of doodles and, and different sounds and phonics. It was pretty cool looking by the end of the year, <laughs> even if I do. I think that's uh, so, so, uh, something I'm really into as well, is like building community in the mm. classroom. So all of your students feel as one and they all get to know each other really well. So that hands activity where you're drawing around your hands and you're writing something about yourself, you're sharing it, you're cutting out the hands, sticking it on the wall, talking to one another, you're, you're breaking down the barriers and you're building trust among other students so they feel empowered to speak up maybe some of the shyer students would normally be quite reticent to speak and because yeah. they feel that they trust one another uh, they're more likely to speak up and to get involved and you're also going to get less instances of poor behavior as well it's just build this whole energetic dynamic of of care and support among your students yeah and actually students don't need to draw some of my students didn't want to draw and that was absolutely fine like the first when i first got into graphic facilitation i maybe became a bit of an annoying teacher <laughs> in a you should draw this try to copy this doodle and i knew that some students were just kind of oh, no i don't want to so the following year i thought i would do a bit of non-action research but so i didn't ask anybody to draw i didn't encourage them to draw but i drew myself and then naturally some students just started drawing in, of their own accord because they saw my drawings and they saw that it was easy to copy them. So they just started doing it themselves. So I stopped asking them and just kind of led by example in the end instead. You must have been Which quite really happy to, I bet you really like you like looking up and then you can see students drawing. It must have made you really happy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and some of them were just incredibly creative and it was actually really quite empowering for the students who maybe lack a bit of confidence with their language, but they can really excel at drawing in class as well. Mm, and I remember yeah. actually when I was a student in my French class, I, mm -hmm. I found myself drawing to concentrate. And I think my French teacher just thought that I was not paying attention, but my, I think I'm quite a fidgety person. <laughs> So I think it was something for me to do and it helped me to pay attention and sketch noting helped me pay attention. And I remember my French te teacher taking that book and throwing it in the bin in front of everybody. It was quite embarrassing, but at the same time I thought mm -hmm. I was learning there, but he just wasn't understanding. And now, let's welcome Laura Wilkes. Oh, what a brilliant Hello, welcome. Laura. Thank you so much. I mean, that was like the best introduction ever. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Stu. <laughs> no, oh, good. Very, thank you very much for accepting the invitation. Uh, Stu, of course, recommended, and you very nicely said, yeah, no problem. 
Of course. Uh, I didn't know you were watching as well sometimes the ESL live stream, so I feel very touched, uh, very thankful. So we have a, uh, in front of us a, a very professional podcaster because with Stu, you know, we also, we are teachers, you know, so we have some uh, stuff to do first. And then podcasting is something, you know, try to help. So we started really from nothing on the ESL live stream with a, a poor microphone, with a poor headphones that work sometimes. And just when it's not, when you can't hear me, is going to be Stu that can hear me. <laughs> it's, it, it, it was incredible. So starting, there's always a start, there's always a beginning, and it's always a pain but yeah thank you so much for uh really for being here today so uh, maybe you can introduce a little bit yourself laura to everyone so that they they can know you a bit better absolutely so some folk who joined this live and hello to everybody who's watching right now you may recognize my voice uh from tsol pop that's the mini podcast for busy teachers and we are currently celebrating our sixth birthday at tsol pop which is so fantastic and as Stu was saying um i did used to work in education full-time used to work for some of the largest educators private educators in the world uh, but a year ago i decided to set up my own business communicating for impact where i help educators and educators in business specifically start recording content whether it's podcasts videos or even starting to get live streams going so they can really utilize media to engage their students and potentially grow their business as well Well, well, how do I start topics yeah. and stuff? <laughs> Where on earth what to would start? You, how would you start? Yeah, <laughs> big the questions. The beginning is always difficult. Yeah. <laughs> Um, <laughs> gosh, well, firstly, I think it can be quite intimidating if we just try and kind of look for topics that are trending in mass media, right? That can be quite a scary uh, space to navigate and think about what our value proposition right. is, particularly on topics like AI. AI is very much trending at the moment. If we try and just tackle that on a on a large scale, that, that could be quite a quite a large goal to set as a beginner. What I encourage my um, trainees to do on the podcast Pathfinder program I do, that's that's a beginner course for podcasters. Um, I get them to really identify who their target audience is. So rather than setting large, kind of the, their net large, like casting a, a large net, I should say, a wide net, um, trying to really focus on who your ideal listener is and what they are interested in. So let's say you're working with, um, let me take an example. You're, you're working with Spanish speakers who have moved to the US recently and they are struggling with English because they are mature students and they need a way in. And you know that they find the school environment really intimidating. So maybe in that case, your your podcast focuses on it's in Spanish and English. It's it's mixed and it focuses on key things like key phrases and scenarios that your learners need in order to start building their language level to be successful. That's just one example taken from um, a podcaster I'm working with. But that whole kind of really being really niche and being really intentional, really asking yourself, what does my ideal listener need? what's going to serve them and then following that as a path rather than looking to the bigger kind of media trends um as your indicator because really if you try and please everyone you just end up pleasing no one so it's better just to be really intentional about who you're creating content for exactly yeah. it's pretty much like a teacher it's like a teacher in the classroom you get to know your students very well so that you can start to give a the right, what they need. Exactly. And saying that, isn't there so much transfer, transferable skills that teachers have that just slide over into media so easily? Podcasting is very much like very like doing a detailed uh, learner needs analysis. Exactly what you do for your listeners, like really talk to your listeners, get to know what they want, exactly what you do with the students. And I, I think one thing as well, like, like for example, AI, it's a really trending topic, but like, it's going and moving so fast and, you know, unless you're a really big AI, you know, uh, you know expert or anything, you know, your, your content probably won't match the content 
of other real experts with AI. So maybe also go with what you're comfortable talking with as well. Mm -hmm. Let's say you you have you you planned out like the first six episodes of something you want to say. Maybe you can stick to topics that you're really comfortable talking about. Um, maybe you know you have a big interest in reading strategies for for language learning or something like that. So you might want to talk about that, for example. Uh, go with something at first that you're really comfortable with, and then you're going to it's going to be much easier to make the podcast. And what you have to say, what I think will really resonate more with the listener, because it's coming from a, a position of authority and knowledge that you already have. Exactly. And that's just so much easier to to kind of plan, isn't it? And talk about it will come through in your passion and authenticity in talking about something that you have experience with. And I think a lot of teachers hesitate in putting their voice out there because they feel like they're not experts in something. But your experience as a teacher talking about your contacts is really powerful in creating space for other people who may be listening to be like, oh, that really resonates for me. Oh, I do that too. Oh, I hadn't thought of that. And that's expertise in itself is opening the door to what is very usually a closed door profession. We have inspectors in that do observations, quite scary observations a couple of times a year. But having that space to kind of open up the door is is um, credible in itself in talking about your experience from things that have happened. Yeah. And we get a question in the live. Uh, Basha was asking, uh, I want to start my channel English for kids. Any advice? Oh, this is really That's exciting. Thank you. Um, yeah. <laughs> so going back to the idea of like who your ideal audience is, I think if you can talk to parents and do a little bit, um, have a few conversations now to kind of get some ideas, it, this is how you kind of start building fans early on, is before you even start recording the content, you start talking to people who would be your ideal target audience. So you can talk to them about ideas for topics, uh, maybe giving... Um, walking through do you think this would be fun would you like this type of thing what sort of would you like me to play games on my channel yes. that's sort the of thing what's your favorite game like asking those sort of questions are really reassuring and then when you're ready to go live you can say hey i created this what do you think and get their feedback so going back to that ideal listener talk to them now do do talk to a few different people five or six different sets of parents to get your ideas and that will really help to inspire you brilliant question Great. So I, I got a I got a question, uh, especially for, for for podcasting. It would be like, what can you tell us a little bit about the steps that e involved planning or pro producing educational podcast episode? How should should we start? How to plan everything? How to do it the right way? Uh, I, I don't know if there's a, such a thing as a, a right way, but I can tell you a way that really works well yes. that saves time, maybe. Um, the first step would be to think about your vision. And I know this sounds probably a bit like, oh, are we not starting with the tech? Yeah. But I think many people overlook this. Like, what are you hoping a podcast is going to do for you? Do you want to use it to grow your business? Are you using it as a way to kind of grow your personal brand? Um, is it a complement to the teaching that you're doing? Is it kind of like a flipped classroom approach? What, what's the vision? How does it fit? That's the first thing. Um, and I, I encourage people to really visualize that and how it fits into what they're currently doing. Um, the second part is I would say to plan six episodes. You learn so much from six. If I'm ever planning mm -hmm. any type of media, six is a good number. You tend to see repetition and patterns in terms of, oh, this is a bit of a challenge or, oh, this is working really well when you commit to six. And it can also stand alone. Um, so if you choose at the end, well, I'm not going to continue with this. It's still a nice packaged project that you can utilize turn into blogs, turn into other things, recycle, clip up, uh, that will serve you. So that would be um, the first two steps. And I can see uh, Stuart's keen to, is biting the bit to add to add a bit more. What are you going to say, Stu? No, 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 it's just, um, <laughs> um, what, I, no, uh, what I was going to say um, was, uh, when we were talking at IATEFL, we, we talked about um, some things that are bottlenecks for um teachers to get going things that they worry about and obviously you know that tech is is one but you know we talked about how you don't need a lot of tech to to start um another one is like you know perhaps teachers might not know what to say um we've covered that as well but one thing we also talked about IATF was that some teachers can be quite um worried that 
they're kind of they're going to look silly in front of their friends um hey look at me look at my new channel and everything and they're kind of really worried about that is there mm. any kind of advice you might want to give to those kind of teachers yeah it can be really tricky can't it particularly if you start thinking about everybody who can have access to it if you're putting something out in the public sphere i mean not all podcasts are public some do them privately within um, a learning management system or they're behind paid subscription walls but if it is in the public sphere like you are at the the mercy of everybody listening to it but coming back to that point of who your ideal listener is you're not for everyone and so if somebody listens to it and doesn't follow that's not your problem you're, you're designing content for a very specific person and i think if you really get intentional about imagining who you're speaking to and who you're creating content for so it feels like you can literally visualize them sat across the table from you when you're recording it becomes so much easier because you're, you're creating stuff for them. And these are most likely people, real people um, that teachers who are creating content know. Um, and when you kind of visualize those people, it becomes a, le a lot less intimidating, I find. And all mm. the rest, it doesn't really matter what they think because it's not for them. It's for this particular person. Yeah, that's it. And maybe for you that would mean releasing once every other every two weeks uh, or once a month while you work on finishing the following three but go back to what you can sustain and what's consistent i when i when i was um podcasting a few years ago i wanted to scale my portfolio podcast tso pop and i wanted to go from being uh once every two weeks to once every week because I just thought, oh, it's just the thing I, I want to do. I want to try and grow. But I wasn't in a position where I had the resources or time to do so. So I, I I went to once a week. And can you guess what happened? Like after I went to once a week when I wasn't ready? Yeah. Can you guess? Yeah, yeah I did. you didn't have time. To, you, you probably made time, but like you sacrificed other stuff and you probably pulled a ton of your own hair yeah. out exactly and i began to really not enjoy podcasting as a result i almost gave it up because it just wasn't fun um it, and i'm glad i just kind of took a moment to ask myself what why am i putting myself under this pressure like why am i doing this to myself mm -hmm. um and i went back to to every two weeks and then i began to enjoy it again and um, we're, we're now a, a weekly podcast and um, because i have the resources so i i learned from making that mistake that really you have to go with what's sustainable what and what you can remain consistent with and also what will bring you joy um mm. if you find yourself in a position not enjoying the creative process it i find personally it does come through i can yeah. tell that i'm not enjoying it and it becomes a bit of a strain so that you, yeah try and avoid that i hope that's helped maria thanks for your question and we get another question from English uh, for all over asking, do you set targets for followers? Yes, I do. Um, maybe less huh. so followers, but more so downloads. Um, so I guess there's a few metrics that you can look at. And for me, I've been looking at the number of download rates. Um, that means like how many people are actually getting yeah. the podcast on their um, on their devices and then I look at the listen rate so what's the listen through rate um, and that's been really good to kind of see how well promotions are working for podcasts that this is one thing that um, perhaps people won't ask me which I'd like to share and that is if you're going to create something please tell people about it please don't just build it and expect people to arrive please be open and out there and saying hey I have a podcast I think this is going to be helpful would you mind having a listen hey I have a podcast it's about this I think this could be helpful like tell people about it go to spaces where your listeners hang out and then look at the analytics in terms of the download rate yes followers is very very useful to look at but downloads listens the amount of time that people are spending listening to an episode these are really helpful to kind of help you make um strategic decisions about content and how you stretch your episodes brilliant we've got great yes all good yeah uh, i was reading uh paul who's writing that was the question i wanted to i wanted to ask as well as uh how can teachers promote their podcast you know to reach a wider audience and including students you know parents and colleagues maybe well so how can they promote their 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 um yeah, podcast yeah so i see the comment there about ads um i i would 
advise for going organic first rather than paying for adverts um when you're yeah. starting i mean paid adverts can can work later on if you if you want to obviously invest in that but i think the best places to start is to ask yourself is where are your ideal listeners hanging out and i don't mean like physical spaces although it can be physical spaces like Stu and i were at ayatafel uh this week which is um an international convention for uh, TEFL and TESOL teachers. So, of course, I was there with TESOL pop banners telling people about TESOL pop, giving out cards say, and chocolate to mm -hmm. bribe people to to, what, to listen to the podcast, and that went pretty well. Um, but I also post in uh, groups online, social media groups, like LinkedIn has like an ELT professionals group where I tell people about the latest episodes. I do it on Facebook. I write blogs and articles for journals where my listeners are reading stuff. So really go to places where your listeners are hanging out and tell them about it. Remember, you're providing value for them. So you should tell people and so they can make up their own decision if they want to go and listen or not. Yeah, I think um, that that's I think if uh, people can identify uh, what's working and then just kind of follow that. Uh, I think lots of people do like a kind of like a scattergun kind of strategy, a little bit of Twitter, a little bit of LinkedIn and kind of look at the analytics, right? And, and try yeah. to, you know, smell what's working kind of thing. And uh, yeah, like you say, um, ads, um, paid ads can be expensive. Um, often they don't kind of work that well. And especially if you're starting out, it's like you say, grow, grow things organically. You talked about like writing articles and things. How if you wanted to use that as a strategy for let, getting your podcast or your new website or whatever it is that you're doing, what kind of ways would you use to identify who to what to write and who to write for? Yeah, so I think it's kind of going through the different journals and spaces. So, for example, I write for ETAS, which is the English Teachers Association Switzerland, um, and they share a very similar audience to the TESOL pop audience. Not everybody in the ETAS audience will be exactly my listener, but there's a good proportion who are. So, again, coming back to kind of writing stuff and looking at the not pressing your agenda necessarily onto those journals. You have to really also look at what their audience needs and how you can maybe bring, for example, my case media. And um, I do like a resource review where I res review books, courses, um, gadgets, and other platforms for teachers. So that's a good space to kind of get my name out there. And I'm not necessarily talking about the podcast all the time. I'm talking about things within my realm of expertise and my bio's there and it says where, where they can find out more. So I think that's a good strategy to kind of see like, are they a similar um, crossover to your target audience? And can you provide value uh, to that particular space as well. Did I answer your question, Stu? I feel like yes, I may you have did. Yeah, yeah, very, very well. But I also post in uh, groups online, social media groups. Like LinkedIn has like an ELT professionals group where I tell people about the latest episodes. I do it on Facebook. I write blogs and articles for journals where my listeners are reading stuff. So really go to places where your listeners are hanging out and tell them about it. Remember, you're providing value for them. So you should tell people and so they can make up their own decision if they want to go and listen or not. Yeah, I think um, that that's I think if uh, people can identify uh, what's working and then just kind of follow that. Uh, I think lots of people do like a kind of like a scattergun kind of strategy, a little bit of Twitter, a little bit of LinkedIn and kind of look at the analytics. Right. And, and try yeah. to, you know, smell what's working kind of thing. And uh, yeah, like you say, um, ads, um, paid ads can be expensive. Um, often they don't kind of work that well. And especially if you're starting out, it's like you say, grow, grow things organically. You talked about like writing articles and things. How, if you wanted to use that as a strategy for let, getting your podcast or your new website or whatever it is that you're doing, what kind of ways would you use to identify who to what to write and who to write for? 
Yeah, so I think it's kind of going through the different journals and spaces. So, for example, I write for ETAS, which is the English Teachers Association Switzerland, um, and they share a very similar audience to the TESOL pop audience. Not everybody in the ETAS audience will be exactly my listener, but there's a good proportion who are. So, again, coming back to kind of writing stuff and looking at the not pressing your agenda necessarily onto those journals. You have to really also look at what their audience needs and how you can maybe bring, for example, my case media. And um, I do like a resource review where I res review books, courses, um, gadgets, and other platforms for teachers. So that's a good space to kind of get my name out there. And I'm not necessarily talking about the podcast all the time. I'm talking about things within my realm of expertise and my bio's there and it says where, where they can find out more. So I think that's a good strategy to kind of see like, are they a similar um, crossover to your target audience? And can you provide value? Uh, to that particular space as well. Did I answer your question, Stu? I feel like yes, I may you have did. Yeah, yeah, very, very well, very well. Because it can be quite kind of like not intimidating, but you kind of just you don't know where to start. That's the thing, and you, and you sit down. And you're like, well, yeah. I, I want to do this, but I don't know how. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You mean with like the podcasting itself, or the promotion, or both? Everything. You know, you, <laughs> you, you sit down. You're like, well, I. I, so other people do this I think I can do this as well I've got something good to say but I don't know how to begin yeah I think maybe a good space would uh, for those that may be feeling that way is like oh I don't know where to start is why not just try it out I mean we're, we're doing a, a guest interview today there's lots of creators like Mike uh, like yourselves do who would welcome having guests on their shows so maybe experimenting that way and working with other collaborators bringing value to their spaces and um, can be a great way to inspire yourself to think oh yeah actually I think this will work for me mm -hmm. and to also start finding your voice as somebody who wants to use your voice to to create media whether it's podcast videos or live streams yeah do you know um today you've probably seen on the on the tv today's a London marathon right yeah yeah I haven't actually seen it on the TV today, yet. So, you know thousands of record number of runners and they're talking to a marathon runner and they said, you know, what's the biggest piece of advice you can for someone who would one day like to run a marathon? He said that the hardest thing to do is to go out through the front door. Yeah. To, to, to do your first one, to open the door and step out into the road. And I guess it's the same same with podcasting, right? Just uh, sit down with pen and paper and uh, just begin. Just try it. And we can be our own worst critics as well, can't we? In when we listen back to things, I, I think that's also an area of discomfort when you're working with media that you're going to edit and have. And if you're editing it yourself, that can be quite um, a difficult thing to face. It's not comfortable, is it? Really, when you're having to listen back to your voice and, and see and it's yourself. It's not intuitive, like mm -hmm. you, you mentioned audacity, um, which I use as well. Um, and yeah, it's me too. free and everything, <laughs> but blimey, when you open it up, you're like. I, what what do I click like so it kind of takes you a while to get your head around it yeah and that's I, but it once you do and you find like your shortcuts like with any editing software they usually find your, your shortcuts that work for you and you also are able to kind of control the recording environment more and um, we always say when we're creating content is that post productions fixed in fixed in pre-production so like really setting up your microphone doing the test making sure you're in a good quiet small space to capture the best audio quality um, and maybe having talking points planned on what you're going to say that's going to reduce your editing time significantly and as you get to know what sort of edits you do like the dropping of the music like for example Mike you had your intro music you've got those already stacked right that's part of your routine exactly you, you, yeah, yeah you find it gets easier right I imagine like this is you've been doing this for years And now let's welcome Katie Prescott from A Bridge Academy. Welcome, Katie. Thank you so much for Hi being there, Mike. Thanks so much for having life. me. And I'm loving all the music and sound effects on this. It's awesome. <laughs> uh, yeah, just put in a little bit of rhythm. You know, it's Sunday night. People tomorrow's got to go to work. Well, even if it's Sunday morning, you still have the whole day. But, you know, uh, got to be like a bit of active being active 
and thank you so much. It's a great pleasure uh, to have you uh, with us. And Stu might be on. Be back to all. Welcome, Katie. Welcome. Hello, Katie. Oh, okay. No problem. Yeah, it's going to be really you know awesome. that. You know there are buttons that you can touch before life. Can't touch this. You can't touch this. All right. Okay. That was the little fun. <laughs> All right, let's start to be serious. Uh, thank you, Stu. Uh, Stu, uh, you kindly went to Katie uh, to say, hey, we got the live stream. And, you know, how did you guys met each other? Well, yeah, it was kind of it all fell into place, didn't it, Katie? So, yeah, the, like two weeks ago, we had Laura on, and we were talking about how to, you know, develop your online presence as a teacher to develop your own business and then last week we had Bianca on who was talking about how to set up your own academy and then Katie followed my Teflon Lemon page I, I think oh, okay and, uh, yeah and then so we, we just started chatting and apparently Katie used to follow Teflon Lemon when you lived in China right yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been following Teflon Lemon Lemon Lemon, I can speak. <laughs> English is failing me today. Um, we've been following Tefal Lemon on WeChat for several years now, I think. Yeah, yeah. And then so it was great to connect. From a similar kind of place in the world, from the south of England as well. So, uh, like, I, I reached out to Katie. Katie immediately said, yeah, I'm, I'm free. And here we are. So thank you so much for coming along, Katie. I, I, we can't wait to hear about this and lots of uh, lots of the people that follow the ESL live stream they've been saying you know we really want to hear from you because yeah having trouble with uh, getting students so hopefully you can help yeah well thanks so much for inviting me and I'm super excited to share some insights into that whole going independent finding your own students uh, teaching online kind of stuff so yeah Great, uh, Katie. Thank you so much for being in uh, in the live today. We've been chatting through WeChat quite long yesterday. That was really nice, really appreciated. Uh, we have a lot in common for sure, uh, especially if been teaching in China. Uh, <laughs> I had to say a little bit of Chinese, but I guess Stu can say something too, right? Oh, <laughs> 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 Wow. All right. So <laughs> let's switch on. <laughs> let's help. switch on English because time, no they're going to think that. Yeah, they, they're going to think that. Who's the foreigners? They speak Chinese. I don't understand. What is that live stream? <laughs> All right. So uh, can you please introduce yourself uh, briefly for everyone to get to know you a little bit better? Katie, please. Thank you. Yeah, sure. So my name's Katie. Um, I'm from Abridge Academy, uh, which sells teaching materials and resources for online teachers and also helps teachers who are going independent, um, things like finding your own students, top tips and support uh, with things like that. Um, and as a bit of background, I've been teaching online for about 10 years now, actually, quite a while. Um, initially, it was just like a little bit of part time bonus income here and there, you know, as, as you do when you need a, a little extra money to pay the bills and things like that. Um, and I did my teacher training in the UK, qualified as a teacher in the UK. I'd also taught a bit in China before, um, in Beijing, Xijiazhuang, Guangzhou, um, and yeah, and a little bit in Shanghai, the short program in Shanghai. Uh, so I taught a little bit in China before. I'd studied there previously as a student as well. Um, so I'd studied Chinese before. Um, and then I was a bit, did my teacher training in the UK, taught in the UK for a bit, um, and then COVID happens. The whole world shut down. Um, I was actually due to move out to China. Um, I had a teaching job lined up there and I was also looking to expand my business with things internationally. Um, I had all kinds of things lined up, but obviously COVID chaos happened. Everything went online. Um, I ended up setting up um, in collaboration with a Chinese co-partner, an online tutoring agency based in China. Um, and that started in 2020. And as I said, I was meant to be moving out to China, but because of COVID, none of that happened. I ended up sort of sitting at home being like, ah, what do I do? How do I pay my bills? Uh, because I'd left my UK teaching job, you know, to, to go move out to China and it all fell through. Um, so yeah, so it's teaching independently and setting up this tutoring agency. Um, I also had a job lined up in Japan, which then got delayed by like 
forever because of COVID. I ended up going there for a bit, got in Japan for a year and a half, uh, teaching ESL in Japan. Um, and now I'm full-time working on ABIC Academy, doing teach materials and support for online teachers. So, sorry, that was a very long <laughs> rambling backstory, but I've done quite a bit of sort of teaching related things over the last few years. And super excited to be here and share some of that with everyone. What would be the best start for uh, creating his own online uh, classes without any bus in the middle of the road? You know that can that can be really bothering sometimes. You're not that free. How to start? <laughs> that's a big question. <laughs> I feel like we're gonna we're gonna have a lot yeah, to talk about on this topic uh, in this session because true. I understand. Yeah. yeah. I think when it comes to getting started, the most important thing, I think, before you do anything is to come up with a plan. The, I'm not saying it's a mistake as such, but the thing I see a lot of teachers doing is they jump straight in to like, oh, I've done my TEFL course. Um, because some great TEFL training and things out there, but you know, they've, gone, they've gone straight from doing their TEFL training and gone, okay, I'm gonna teach independently, find my own students. Because everyone's saying that's the thing to do right now. Um, you can learn a lot more teaching independently, a lot more flexibility, um, you know, so much more freedom in what you do. Um, but you need a plan because there's so many people out there now. Um, I think going into it without a plan, you'll end up earning $5 an hour doing conversation classes and you know, you'll be better off teaching with a company in that case. Um, so I always think the first thing to do is to sit back and like evaluate what are you, what do you want to achieve with your independent teaching? What is your goal? Do you just want to have a few students, like maybe you're a classroom teacher, right? And you want a few extra students to earn a bit of money on the side, a bit like when I first started way back. Um, which is you have a very different kind of plan to someone who's looking to sort of upscale their business longer term and set up a whole agency or something, right? And I've done that too. So it's sort of different kind of business plan needed. So I think first, when I say business plan, the loosest sense, it doesn't have to be a complicated written out, you know, 100 page document you're going to send to investors or something, but come up with a plan of what are your goals in your business? Um, what do you enjoy teaching? And what expertise do you already have? And try and figure out a bit about what exactly you want to focus in on. For example, I've worked with teachers before who have like, used to be an examiner for like Cambridge or like, IELTS exams or all those sort of you know, big online English, not online, sorry, big in-person like English exams, but a lot of people are looking for online classes for, in which case makes a lot of sense to then focus on exam prep, right? Because they've got existing expertise. Um, well, my, my case, I was a classroom teacher before. Um, I focused primarily on, uh, in the UK, I trained as a secondary school teacher. Um, and I had a lot of experience kind of teaching primary school to middle school kind of ages um, when I was in China and in Japan. So that made sense to me to focus on like students who want to come study abroad who are around middle school kind of age of my kind of preferred age range um, and helping them with learning the sort of academic sort of vocabulary and stuff that they need in order to move to an English medium school or to move abroad entirely. Um, so like figure out what you enjoy teaching, where your expertise is um, and what you might want to offer. Um, so that'd be the first thing. And then try and do a bit of market research, like having got an idea of roughly what you want to do. Try and connect with your target audience, whether that's on social media or it's through platforms you've talked with before or it's on like forum sites or however you could connect with that audience and try and get to know a bit more about them and what actually they want. Because then you can design what you're offering around exactly what your target audience wants. Um, and in that way, you're avoiding just being a generic, oh, I'm an online teacher, I teach English. And you can start to find a little bit more expertise and build a bit more rapport with potential students um, a bit rambling but hopefully that gives you a little bit of an idea of where to start with and try and put together a bit of a plan before you start how would you find your own students how, how do you go about beginning let's say you're on facebook or whatever and you join online teaching groups how do you touch those, you know, get the parents to, how do you do it? I think the first thing to do is not bother joining the online teaching groups if you want to find students in the group. The online teaching groups are full of teachers, right? So first think about where your audience is. Um, and it doesn't have to be on social media. I think this is the, the biggest thing that teachers jump to is straight away, I want to teach online, find my own students, what social media app do they use? Um, and that's one approach, but it does take a lot of time to build an audience and connect with people on social media because you're still kind of competing with everyone else on that social media platform. So actually, I personally would recommend first start out by looking at your own contacts. Like if I think about my own experience and um, getting started teaching independently, 
uh, 10 years back when I found my very first independent student and it was actually for teaching maths. It wasn't even for teaching English. It was, I was still a student myself actually at the time. I was still at university. Um, and it was through a previous teacher I, who I had volunteered in her class. And then she happened to move to the same city as me that I'd gone for university um, to teach in a, a secondary school, a uh, no, sixth form actually, like high school. Um, sorry, British terms. Sixth form is like high school for anyone who's not British. Um, and, she, and one of her students needed some tutoring. So she sent me a message being like, hey, Katie, do you, do you offer some tutoring? Like this could, kid could be someone that you could help. Um, so that just came through a personal connection. And then similarly, much more recently, some people might be aware there were a lot of changes in the Chinese market in summer 2021. The government brought out new regulations and that basically knocked out a bunch of the online ESL companies that were based in China. Um, and at that point, my Chinese teacher reached out to me and I've been taking uh, Chinese classes. This was actually in preparation for supposedly moving to China again, um, which then didn't happen. Um, but I've been taking online classes with a Chinese university. I just sort of brushing up on my Chinese and all that kind of thing. And my teacher reached out to me and said, oh, I've got a couple of friends who all their English classes have been cancelled because uh, the company our classes with got shut down. Um, do you offer English classes? And I was like, oh, yeah, I do, actually. I hadn't even mentioned it to my Chinese teacher. Um, and she reached out to me anyway and was like, do you offer classes? And of course, I was already teaching at this point. Um, so it made a lot of sense. So first start with those personal connections. It could be people you know who've worked abroad or if you take language classes yourself, like your, your language teacher for Spanish or whatever, probably knows other people who are Spanish speakers who want to learn English. You know, reach out to these people in an authentic way. Don't just randomly spam message people, you know, but, you know, if they're friends with you or they're people you've worked with just drop them a message saying, hey, I'm offering English classes. Do you have any friends who might be interested? Or maybe they've got kids, but their kids be interested. Um, and even in your local community as well, like depending on where you live in some parts of the, of the country, there are quite a high percentage of people immigrating to the area who speak English as a second language. And they probably themselves have a good English level because they've probably come with work or something, but maybe their kids are also moving with them and they're moving to like an English medium school and they're not going to have like the academic English, for example, they'll need to settle into an English medium school if they've come from a different country where English is not the first language. Um, so I'd start with your contacts first. And then from there, you can grow even just through referrals with your contacts um, and sort of slowly build up things on social media, like post valuable content, share some interesting ideas, share some insights into what you're teaching, build up a bit of an audience. But that takes time. Um, so I think these, these two things are yeah, two strategies that can kind of help. Yeah, so kind of like growing your growing your like your potential student list organically. So rather than just like spamming people who say, you know, like, you know, hi Jennifer, how's it going? Yeah, blah blah blah. You know, just talk about things and then slowly reach out from there. Um exactly. and also potentially that that parent or that teacher may not have anything right now, but you're you're back on the radar. And then once they hear something, you're going to be the person that they contact. Exactly. And it could just be people, you know, who you don't even think of uh, as being a useful contact who will reach out to you. Um, like, I don't know, your local librarian. Let's say you went to the library and you chatted to the librarian. And you mentioned because, you know, you're getting the word out a bit. You mentioned you're offering English classes just as a side. You know, they asked you what you do. You know, what's your job? Um, and then next time you pop in the library, they'll say, oh, we had this family come in who were looking for English textbooks and they were struggling a bit. And actually they wanted a teacher. And you never know that like, connections come through the most bizarre contacts you've not really necessarily thought of. Um, but it's authentic. And I think that's the key thing. Yeah, we've got someone in the in the in the chat in the uh, on the chat said uh, read with teacher Katie. Um, uh, you only need one good student. and Referrals are the cherry on the top. That's I saw that one. Yeah. Yeah. What, what um, Katie, what, how about referrals? What do you say about that? I think referrals are really, really powerful. Like people trust what their friends recommend to them. If you're just searching online for, imagine you yourself are looking for a Spanish teacher, right? And you just search online for Spanish teachers. There'll be thousands of teachers out there that pop up. There'll be big companies and you think, okay, big legit company, that's more trustworthy maybe. There'll be individuals on platforms like we mentioned Preply already. Um, so what's gonna make you pick an independent teacher? It's gonna be a little bit difficult to even to find them just through search. Whereas a referral is someone saying, I already take classes with this teacher. They are a fantastic teacher. I really love them. I think you should take classes too. And that is so much more powerful because you've got a personal, like person recommending you and they've got that trust with their friend who's going to recommend them a good teacher. Um, and also, I would say in general, 
people tend to know people who are similar to them. So for example, if you're targeting, I don't know, university students, they're gonna know other university students who also want help with academic English for assignments. Or if you're teaching um, phonics classes for really young kids, their parents will know other parents, like who are mums and dads, chat groups, or you know, their local connections. So referrals are really, really powerful. Um, and there's things you can do to try and promote and encourage referrals, but genuinely the most important thing is just being a good teacher. Like if you're a great teacher, people will recommend you. Um, and they just need the occasional reminder perhaps to prompt them when you have a bit more time on the schedule you want to fill up. True, like Brad was saying, it's all about sending yourself and keeping your contacts on WeChat. Well, of course, if you've been in China, for sure. <laughs> uh, but it's... Um, um, yes. So, and then teachers in China don't know generally how to connect with Chinese parents. Like that's what I was saying. The past live last week is just sending moments. Uh, WeChat. You get that option moments. You can even share what you what you're doing. Uh, you know, taking just let your your uh just use your phone and well of course you get to hide your your student's face but you can just let them see what is the result right what the kids are doing during the class what the, how they're speaking when their oral english level after a month you know you got to keep on posting 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 that's pretty much like social media it, it, it's quite close to to that am i wrong or that would be a best way to do it. Yeah, absolutely. I think if you already got apps like WeChat and you've used them already, I think who was it? Who mentioned they already had contacts like from their company they taught with previously, for example. Absolutely, make the most of those connections. Um, there's so many different social media apps out there. If you've already got a presence on one of them and you already got good connections through one app, then start with that one definitely. Um, and WeChat, in particular, if you're targeting Chinese students, then you kind of have to have WeChat. I don't know how anyone could survive without WeChat in China. Like it's, I probably when I lived in China, I probably spent two or three hours a day just on WeChat. I swear. I mean, some of that was just procrastinating, looking at people's random videos and stuff. But like, you need it for messaging. Yeah. You need it for paying for stuff. You need it for literally everything. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's a great app. I, I just wish people around the world knew about WeChat. It's probably the best, the biggest secret. You know, outside of China, no one knows about WeChat. It's like amazing. It's like leaves WhatsApp in the dust big time. Um, yeah, it's an amazing app. It's book too. Yeah, it's like, yeah, it's so cool. It's like kind of Instagram, Facebook and WhatsApp all mixed up into one awesome app. What about if you're a teacher? And this is going to be quite difficult to answer, I fear. Um, let's say you're, you're a teacher and you've never been to China and you don't have... Uh, WeChat and you don't know you don't know where to start and you you kind of start out with no contacts and there will be tons of people watching this now and they'll think yeah that's me so what would you suggest? I would say first think of who your target market is. Um, I'm not gonna, don't want to put people off the Chinese market. I think there's a lot of potential teaching Chinese students. I've had some fantastic experiences teaching in China and online um, to Chinese kids and and adults like Chinese students in general. Um, there's a lot of potential there. But I'd always think first, like, is it definitely the right market for you before you jump into something? And the reason I say that is because all of the social media platforms are different in China because they basically blocked all of the foreign ones. Like you can't get Facebook. You can't get, um, I'm pretty sure WhatsApp's blocked. I don't know. I've never used it when I was in China. Um, Instagram, TikTok, all of the ones that we're familiar with don't work in China. So if you want to connect with Chinese students, you're going to have to learn new apps. And it's not too complicated. Most of them have got the same basic options as you have on like foreign social media apps, but it just requires setting up and getting familiar with a different system. So firstly, plan is China the market for you, is my, always my first recommendation. If you do want to go ahead and focus on the Chinese market, um, then have a look at apps that are more like public. So the thing with WeChat, I would say the easiest comparison to WeChat is WhatsApp, because it's a private messaging app primarily. It's got other features too, and there is like WeChat channels and these sort of things, but um, primarily it's a private messaging app. And if you don't have any contacts, you've got no one to message. So you're kind of stuck because um, you need to know their number or their WeChat ID or their QR code to connect. Right. Um, so instead, there are other apps like probably one of the most popular ones that I really recommend is Xia Hongshu. And Xia Hongshu is it's called Little Red Book in English. Um, it's kind of like Instagram ish. 
um, with a few sort of Pinterest features. It's also got this random email address where people can sell stuff to it and that kind of stuff. But it's kind of like Instagram. And the idea is you can post content and even if you've got zero connections whatsoever, people can find it because it's based on an algorithm that's recommending the content to other people. So I would start out by going on an app like Xiaohongshu, posting valuable content that's relevant to your target audience that's useful, like interesting stuff. Don't post about your classes. Actually, that's not even allowed on Xiao Hongshu. You can't directly promote your classes anyway. But you know, don't post clips in your classes, but instead post something like, these are my top five tips for um, improving your vocabulary or something. And that algorithm is gonna reach the right people and gradually your audience will grow. Great. Uh, we got a very good question right here uh, from Cheesecake on the M. <laughs> uh, here's the question. Uh, as a teacher with experience in the classroom, how do you balance teaching online along with teaching daily classes? What was your teaching schedule at first? I think this is a big challenge and it'd be interesting people in the chat want to let us know if you're classroom teachers because um, myself as a classroom teacher, depending on I've taught in various different environments in the UK in particular, classroom teaching is pretty intense. Um, so I was working like 70 or 80 hours a week. Like there'll be obviously actual classes, but also the planning and the marketing world stuff, right? So find the time is firstly one thing. Um, and I would say in that case, just look at your schedule, right? Obviously you'll be in school from probably about eight until five, maybe but you have your school day. Um, but outside of time, think, you know, do you want to get up really early? I know some teachers do that. I'm not a morning person. Absolutely not a morning person, let me tell you. But I know some teachers who are based in like the US because of the time zone difference. Um, if they're teaching kids who are based in Asian countries like China, they're getting up at sort of three, four in the morning, teaching a few hours before work. Then they go to school and teach all day uh, and then they sleep, I guess, in the afternoon. Um, so like, think about your schedule and where the gaps are that line up with where your target audience is based. And that might actually affect which audience you focus on because you might decide that, you know, 5 a.m. classes are not for you. So if you're in the US, don't teach Chinese kids, teach ones in South America, perhaps who you can teach after school hours instead. Um, but yeah, think about your schedule, where you have gaps, obviously weekends and things like that too. Um, but it's, it's a challenge. Cheers, guys. See you next week. <laughs>